Have you ever been to a place called Sol 3, Pelos, Gaia, or Terra? Someone who is not familiar with any of these names might be confused, wondering where in the universe they exist in. Well, all those names are just names used to refer to our Earth by different cultures, while astronauts might also call it Sol 3. So is the case of the continent of Africa. Africa has had many names in its history. The Dark Continent is one of the many names used to refer to the continent at some point during the age of exploration. There has been a lot of controversies on when the name Africa was first used to refer to the continent and whether the name originated from within the people. While some claim it has been in use since the time the Greeks occupied Africa in 332 BC, others claim it came around in the late 17th century. But this is not something we have come to discuss because we are all familiar with the name Africa as a reference to the continent. Other name it has been called includes Akebulan which means mother of mankind. According to other sources, the Garden of Eden. Some also said it was called Kofi, Otigia, Libya, and Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a Greek name, which means burnt skin. It was a name given to the area today known as Sudan, which was also Kush. Since Ethiopia means burnt skin in Greek, its use might not have been limited to the Kushites, but also the continent in general. This relates to the present Ethiopia, which is a East African country, once called Abyssinia. Due to the harassment of the faces Titli, Emperor Ali Selassie renamed it to always preserve and reflect the country's ancient and historic roots and to emphasize the continuity and unity of the country's culture and identity. During the age of exploration, it was also called the Dark Continent. Now that we've known the other names Africa have been called in its history, let's start examining what made the Europeans call the continent Dark Continent in the age of exploration. There are so many theories that have been used to try to explain the reason why the continent was called Dark Continent. When this phrase first appeared on the internet, people used to think it's a derivation from the color of the majority of people that inhabit the continent. But after a while, the narrative changed and the narrative was that the Europeans do not know what to expect from the continent's sub-Sahara in terms of what lives there, the rivers, mountains, and the people. This became popular, but recently I stumbled on some contents that try to give its own explanation by faulting the popular opinion and making us know that Europeans needed an excuse to colonize the continent so they came up with the idea of that continent that they wanted to civilize the inhabitants. Europeans had been dealing with the sub saharan Africa, in other words, the area that remained unknown, as far as I know, late 1400s to the 1800s, which was mostly along the coast, and only few of them were able to make it to the inland because of the hostility they met in some areas. No one used the term Dark Continent. The term Dark Continent was first used in 1878 in the book titled Through the Dark Continent, which was authored by a Welsh called Sir Henry Morton Stanley. He is an explorer, writer, among many other things. Therefore, in order to answer our question, it would be very important for us to understand the book and its author. Stanley's book came after he had spent 999 days journeying through the earth of Africa, trying to map out rivers, 
locating the source of Nile and finding another explorer called David Livingstone. There were 228 people who started the journey. 224 people were locals and 4 of them Europeans. 114 of them were said to have arrived till early November 1874 when they arrived somewhere in today's Mozambique. It was only the European left. There are chances that these figures are inaccurate because 114 is exact half of those who started and then mm, 999 days. Also, some of the locals who worked as deporters, guide and who started the journey could have left and not died because that's almost 30 years of following a stranger about in the wilderness. Plus, he is also said to have been a brutal and cruel leader. I won't also believe these figures because he was caught exaggerating many things which had happened on the expedition. There is no place where Stanley comes straight to explain in his book why he had referred to the continents as that continent. But that's okay. Authors don't explain such things. It's like watching a movie and expecting an explanation for the movie title. No, it's from the event that we will deduct the reason for the title. It's true Stanley adventured into Africa with the aim of discovering the unknown. In his book, Through the Dark Continent, I noticed Stanley used Africa in reference to the continent in most cases and that continent only in some situations. Then I examined the situations where he used that continent. He used it either when the things he considers savage or dangerous is the topic and when they are approaching the continent or a part that he is curious about. In the main content, he couldn't have used it more than seven times while Africa at least 20 times without counting phrases such as Equatorial Africa and such derivative phrases where of course he has no choice. So with this, I can say he titled his book To the Dark Continent and by extension invented the word not only because people has no knowledge of the interior of Africa but also because of his experience on the continent. He considers some groups savages because of their traditions and unfriendliness. They were attacked and some of them died of sicknesses as well. I will also support this by referencing his other book which he later wrote in 1890 entitled In Darkest Africa. This is 12 years apart, and it's about his second expedition, mostly in the same area, plus rescuing Emin Pasha. In the title, the word dark still appears, and not just dark, but in a superlative form. What has changed to make it end darkest this time? More difficulties. Most people who entered the Turi forest with him died. There was widespread of fever and sleeping sickness. Pygmies mistook them for Arab slave traders and shoot at them with poisoned arrows. Stanley split his expedition at some point and heard of oral stories from the other section of the expedition, which was led by people who followed him on the expedition from Europe. One of them, Ballot by name, they bought a female slave of around 10 years old gave her to the cannibals so they could record her being butchered and eaten. Food was scarce to be found, so they starved. When they met Arab traders, they had to give them their supplies in exchange for food. They finally found Emin in April 1888 and he provided Stanley and his company with food and other supplies. Therefore, Stanley would have only used dark because of his experience in the first traveling and darkest because of the weirdest experience he had. Another thing to support this is that 
After his book in 1890, many books were published that are the title darkest on related title and are not really on exploration of new areas. For example, Enchanting Wilderness, Adventures in Darkest South America, 1936. This book and experience of the author happened several years after the age of exploration and even after the countries of Argentina and other areas the author visited had been well explored and mapped out. Therefore, this is just about the author's experiences or difficulties he met in the area. Another is in Darkest South Carolina, which is a book about the segregation of black Americans in South Carolina in the 1950s. The author could have chosen the title here due to the uncivilized act or something else but surely not because of an unknown phenomenon. However, I will conclude this by saying three things could have inspired the phrase as Stanley's title, and those include his experiences or difficulties, the unknown, and his skills as an experienced writer. Writers know how to make their contents appealing to their audience, and that could really draw attention then probably the skin color. Meanwhile, these are just Stanley reason of referring to the continent as that continent. Them might have been used to refer to specific things, ranging from skin color, weird and difficult experience, and unknown things, depending on who is using it in those days before independence of African countries. The usage is now outdated since it's offensive in modern day world Stanley wrote, only by proving that we are superior to the savages, not only through our power to kill them, but through our entire way of life can we control them as they are now in their present stage. It is necessary for their own well-being, even more than us. So for those thinking Europeans needed an excuse to colonize the continent, so came up with this phrase, we might have a point with the second part of the sentence. But I don't think a man who wrote this first part would think they need an excuse. Books written during and after colonization would point to different things, suggesting that people used it for different purposes. When the Europeans got to the Americas, they named it the New World. They called it a New World because they never knew it existed. The continent they had always known was their continent, Asia and Africa. All these were referred to as the Old World. Of course, as it used to be in the days of old, kingdoms in the Old World ventured into one another, traded, conquered and ruled one another. Soon after they got to the New World, the same thing was the case but the interior of Africa were left out of action for a long time while they know it exists. The reason for this is that Africa's geographical area had made penetrations into the interior difficult. At the north is the Great Barrier of the Sahara, the largest desert in the world. With its hot weather and dryness, it used to be impossible to cross. In other parts of it are thick bushes and forests, which makes journeying into the interior difficult. Also, they couldn't stand the general climate. Those who find their way in get infected easily and die of different disease. There used to be a scene at that time, beware, beware of the bite of Benin, one comes out where 50 went in. For a long time, Europeans traded along the coast of Africa and explored the interiors, notably from the 1700s. Though few of them gained access as early as the 1300s, their activities were fewer in the interior until the late 1700s. It is an exciting thing to explore new places. 
During this period, it is a big dream of an European to become an explorer. But the thing is, it requires lots of money, as well as geographical knowledge or people with experiences that could be useful in such mission. Most of the explorers were either missionaries, a soldier, assistant to other explorers, or a child of an explorer, and they were sponsored as well. Though they were equipped with necessities or supplies that would help them in overcoming the difficulties that would come up in their journey, things were not easy for them. Many of them died in the process and the others were lucky to have only lost members of their expeditions from Europe who were meant to assist them. One of the explorers, Mongo Park, who was known for his works on the River Niger, was sponsored by the African Association. It is an association formed in London and dedicated to the exploration of West Africa. Park had the opportunity to be sponsored to trace River Niger because Daniel Uten, who was first given the project, had died in the Sahara. He was said to have grown from his traveling companions in the desert because he feared they would kill him, so he left without food and water. He died of starvation and his remains were eaten by scavengers. Park entered the interior of Africa through Gambia and tried to locate the river Niger. When he got to Ludama, he was imprisoned by the Moors, who were Muslim, who thought he was a Christian spy. After four months, he escaped with his horse and compass and soon found the river Niger. But not long, he returned to the land because he had no resources. He soon returned to the river and started tracing his course until he fell ill. He was hospitalized by natives of Kamalia in Madingo for seven months. When he recovered, he returned home, boarding a slave ship. At home, he theorized to his sponsors that Congo and Nanja River are the same. That does not help, so he was sent back in January 1805 by the government and this time with about 40 men. By August of the same year, only 11 of them were left alive and they had not started tracing the Great River because it was raining season. They died of fever and dysentery. Finally, those who embarked on the journey on the river were Park himself, Martin, three European soldiers, one of them mad a guide and three African slaves. Before his departure, Park sent home letters with an account of their experiences back to Gambia to be delivered to Britain. Their journey on the river went smooth, but that was for a while because Muslim traders from the areas he had begun the journey did not believe Park was exploring purely for intellectual curiosity but was scouting European trade routes. They saw Park as a threat to their trading dominance. They lobbied a man named Manson Deara to have Park killed. And when Manson couldn't, they lobbied for tribes who lead further down the river. Park knew they planned to kill him, so adopted the policy of staying away from the shores towards the middle of the river while attacking anyone who came near. By doing this, he also avoided paying tolls, bribes, and passed through each kingdom, an act which earned him the rage of the local rulers, Moorish Muslims or not. They sent messengers ahead to the next tribe down the river that a dangerous interloper was coming their way. Furthermore, Park's policy of shoot first in some cases caused him to slaughter significant numbers of natives using superior firepower. This earned him more enemies. They were chased several times. At one incident, 60 canoes came after them and they survived. One African who had traveled with them named Amadi was sent to trade with the local chief 
at Ausa Fulani, edge of Mali today. Park gave him five silver rings, some powder and flints to give as a gift to the chief of the village. At the end of the trade, Amadi was accused of not giving the chief a gift, and so they arrested Amadi at the village. The king then sent an ambush to Busa, where the river was not that wide. Park and the rest of the expedition got there. They were attacked and their boat got stuck on a rock. They all drowned as arrows rained on them. Only a slave who followed them survived the attack and gave the report to Amadi, who was later released. And Amadi gave the account of the event to the British that investigated. Park was buried at the river bank. One of Park's sons did not believe that his father died. Therefore, he decided to find his father's whereabouts. He entered through Guinea, and when he went into the interior a bit, he died of fever in 1827. Park traced River Niger as a single river up to somewhere in the modern day Nigeria, which is most of the job. The Landa brothers took over from where he stopped, traced it and discovered that it leads into the Atlantic Ocean in present-day Nigeria. Dr. David Livingstone was many things, a physician, a Christian missionary, an explorer who was known for his missionary works and efforts towards abolishing slavery. Livingstone came into Africa through the Cape of Good Hope in 1840 and with other two missionaries, Ross and his wife. He worked with other missionaries who had been around and settled in Mabotsa. At Mabotsa, lions often come into the village to attack the cattle reared by the villagers. Therefore, they decided to launch a hunting expedition against the lions. Livingstone volunteered to join them during the hunt, Livingstone had a clear shot at a lion, but had to reload. As he was reloading, the lion pounced upon him and broke his arm. Other hunters fought the lion in the process and the lion died. He survived and his arm was fixed with the help of Edwards, a fellow missionary. That was around his fourth year in Southern Africa. David Livingstone was loved and he worked as a doctor, helping the natives while he does his missionary works. He is considered the greatest African missionary of the time. He is known to have converted only one African to Christianity, and that is a king in 1849, after two years of patient persuasion. They were living to made him to divorce four out of his five wives in compliance to the Christian teachings, which he did, but few months later, the king impregnated one of those he divorced. He practiced his traditional religion along with Christianity and helped spread Christianity throughout his tribe, but Livingstone had abandoned him since he impregnated his divorced wife. He rose to fame after mapping most of the course of the Zambezi River to the Indian Ocean and being the first European to discover the smoke that thunders, a waterfall which he renamed Victoria Falls. In 1856, he returned to Britain, where he proposed that missions and legitimate commerce by Zambezi River into the Central Africa would end slave trade. Therefore, he was sent back by the government on the missions related to commerce civilization and Christianity. His third journey to Africa was by his friends in Royal Geographical Society. He was known to have underreported his sufferings in Africa and also labeled a bad leader for the following reasons. He suffered over 30 attacks during his first journey but understated this and his sufferings and overstated the quality of land he would find. He set out his party to a swampy area 
without adequate supplies of quinine. People are more likely to have malaria in swampy areas and quinine is used as medication. His experiences in Africa were generally marred with deaths from malaria and other disease, which killed his wife and other Europeans he worked with. On his last expedition, which began in 1866, while trying to trace the source of the Nile, his assistants gradually deserted him, stole his supplies, including medicines, and falsely reported that he is dead. He became seriously sick in 1869, but was saved by Arab slave traders. At some point, he had to entertain the locals in return for food. His mission on tracing the source of Nile was aborted when he became shattered after witnessing Arab's massacre of about 400 Africans in 1871 in a revenge war. He died of malaria and dysentery in May 1873 in modern-day Zambia. His heart was buried under a tree, and the site it was buried became known as Livingstone Memorial today. His body was mummified and taken back to Britain. His story had always been elusive of Chuma and Susi, who happened to be his most loyal servants, as I see it. I found them interesting because they accompanied him on most of his journeys in Africa to his death. They were among those who carried his body to the coast, a 63 days journey. They also went to Britain in 1874, visiting his family and helping to transcribe Livingstone's journal. In another explorer story, John Arnold Speck, a British soldier, he had to team up with another already famous explorer called Richard Burton. Burton was on a quest to find the source of Nile. The expedition was funded by the Royal Geographical Society. While in Barbera, their camp was attacked by 200 men and Speck hid under the tent while the rest of the party were trying a counter. Burton noticed and quickly called him into the fight. Speck shot several attackers, but at the end, of the four members of his expedition, one was killed. Burton's cheek were damaged with a javelin. Speck himself was wounded and captured, while they stabbed him several times with spears, and he escaped. Only one of them was untouched. Speck's action caused serious disagreements between the two throughout the time they worked together. Lake Tanganyika was theorized to be the source of Nile. By the time they got to Lake Tanganyika, Button was sick and Speck was partially blind from staring too much at the sun. They were to explore the lakes to see if it's the source of the Nile, but they only had small canoes. Button was too sick to move around on the lake, so Speck explored it with the few others. Things wouldn't work out with their small boats because the movement was slow, so they decided to rent a large boat from an Arab. In the process, Speck became partially deaf for some time when he tried to remove a beetle who had crawled into his ear using a knife. They couldn't get the boat still. Weeks later, a local guide told them a river is linked into the Lake Tangayika. Burton was convinced that that was Juvenile and he set home Why Speck broke away from the party because he didn't trust the judgment. Speck had heard of another lake and went ahead to explore it. He later called it Lake Victoria. One after the other, they got home and gave different sources for the Nile. This caused a lot of arguments. After so many efforts, they organized a debate between them to settle it. The debate was to hold on September 16, 1864. But days before then, Speck went out to a field to relax from the stress 
and shoot partridges. He was found dead in the area on the 15th of September 1864. He was found to have shot himself. Some think it was by accident, while others argued he killed himself intentionally because he was afraid to face button in the debate. If he had lost the debate, he would have been accused of trying to mislead the public and would have lived a shameful life. But if he won, he would be famous and rich. Button's Tangaika sauce was accepted the next day and he was rewarded. Meanwhile, in the 1874 to 1877's Henry Stanley expedition, Stanley was able to establish that Speck was right after he had taken tour around Lake Victoria. He also established that Lake Tangaika was not connected to the Nile. For 6,000 years of recorded human history, no one had in their hobby or excitement of traveling and exploration decided to explore the whole world or a place as large as a continent until the late 1200s. Today, one might wonder, is it that no one was curious to discover other places until that age? Of course not. It is because it is a difficult task. Otherwise known as the age of discovery, age of exploration is a period between the 15th and 18th century when Europeans set sail to discover and explore other lands that are unknown to them. Not only that, this age also produced expansion of geographical knowledge about the earth. During this age, European kingdoms run the same way just as kingdoms in Africa and Asia. I'm talking about rivalry, envy, and strives to supersede each other. Though no one can say precisely a particular time that marked the beginning of the age of exploration, I would say European exploration outside the Mediterranean started out with the Portuguese reaching out to the lands such as Canary Island, Madeira and Azores and the coast of West Africa, all between 1336 and 1434. Later, they established a sea route to India in 1498, which enabled them to trade around the area because the Ottoman Empire had blocked the one way they used to trade before. This is a lot. These achievements today would be compared to the 1957 when Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1 into space. This caused a lot of worries for other powerful countries and put USSR itself above others who were yet to achieve such feats. So it is in Europe in the age of exploration. Portugal was hired and somehow monopolized West African sea routes to reach the East Indies, where they trade. In 1492, Spain had tried to sponsor Christopher Columbus to travel west in search of another sea route to the Indies. Instead of discovering the sea route to Indies, they discovered new lands in what would later be dubbed the New World today, the Americas. This was a major event when we talk about the Age of Exploration or colonial eras because as soon as the americas were discovered new opportunities such as raw materials trade and areas to colonize presented themselves by 1783 the colonization of the new world had ended through a series of revolts it's very important to note that even though european new africa existed they didn't explore the interior until they were done with the Americas. So one reason they could have come to explore the interior of Africa is to map it out for future exploitation and colonization since they had lost the Americas. I remember being made to believe that at first, Europeans' intention in the interior of Africa was to know about the geographical area only. Major exploration in Africa began in the 1830s 
and by 1886, around 56 years later, Africa had been shared among them. When America was discovered, it took 115 years to start its colonization, which means probably they didn't plan its colonization at first, but switched into the idea later. With this, I can say the colonization of America was a catalyst for exploration of Africa. While the first catalyst for the age of exploration is rivalries between European kingdoms. European kingdoms who had lesser territories when Americas were colonized, wise up, got into the forefront of exploring Africa and established relationships with African kingdoms through series of treaties which had earned them most of the colonies on the continent. Another catalyst is the advancement in technology. In the 11th century, magnetic compass was invented in China and its use spread gradually. By early 13th century, it had reached Europe. Also, ships grew in size and could resist storms, therefore could now see longer distance without stopping. Without all this, Though movement on the sea is still possible, it used to be more difficult and require larger crews. There are stories of lost ships and stranded ships from sailors who wandered off. I would make mention of the popular story of a Malian king who traveled towards the Americas in the early 1300s with the intention of discovering what is beyond the oceans. He sent two expeditions. The first one, out of the 200 ships, only one of them returned with the news of how the 119 ships had perished in a storm. Then he himself arranged 2,000 ships and went on the expedition. No one knows what became of him, though there are claims of evidence that ships and spears that originated from West Africa were found somewhere around the coast of Americas. Even if it was from the expedition, he never returned to claim his throne, and Malians never knew what became of their king. These are one of the perils explorers risk in those days. Therefore, as technology brought comfort, exploration became easier, and more people traveled the world to discover things they never knew existed. There's one thing I will talk about under technological advancement as another reason that facilitated exploration of Africa in particular. When Christopher Columbus reached America, there are evidence that he received a warm welcome from the natives of the New World. They were friendly that Columbus divided his company into two. One part waited in the land with the natives of the Americas, while Christopher with his second group kidnapped some natives back to Spain as an evidence of the new world they had found. Europeans who first tried accessing Africa from its west faced hostilities. This is because some of them were perceived as slave traders or seen as a threat to the traditions of the land. Though they came with guns, the guns were not advanced to repel attacks from several arrows because the guns are slow. In the later years of African exploration, repeating rifles and artillery had been introduced. In 1885, Maxim gun, today machine gun, was invented in the Europe. Between 1492 and 1914, Europeans controlled 84% of the world. It's their world. Britain itself had control over almost 70% of them, though all these are not at once. Therefore, I can say at a point in history, it used to be European world. And just as we have today, everything new they had learned about the planet, they teach their new ones in school, as knowledge is power. People who went outside their own continent to give them news about what exists in other places around the world were considered heroes, were honored and given recognitions in various ways. 
they were also immortalized in various ways, including in their educational system. In their basic education, they thought about things like who discovered River Ninja as Mongo Park, who discovered Victoria Falls as David Livingstone, who stopped the killing of twins in Nigeria, Mary Slessor, and many other things. By some means, these teachings find its way into the educational system of African countries and thrived even till around 2010. I don't know about this current period. What I know is that there has been several criticisms against it on the internet these days. People make arguments by asking questions like, how can Mongupa discover River Ninja where our ancestors had been fishing? trading and even collecting tolls for several years before Mongo Park traveled on it. This question is true. In some proper and maybe modern day texts, they would say Mongo Park was the first European to discover River Niger in 1806. Is this true? Well, the Greeks might have been the first European to reach the Great River, as it is argued that they gave it the name. Whether that's true or not, this certainly means the Greeks had been in contact with the river before Mongo Park came around. Also, on an earlier map of Africa drawn by Monster Sebastian, a German cartographer around 1552, the river Niger can be seen on it, but soon stopped here. On later maps up to 1787, the Great River is seen extending east further. All these maps were drawn from information collected from several Europeans who had been to different parts of Africa and they were put together. What this means is that Europeans know well that the Great River exists and an insignificant number of them had been to different areas of it at one time or the other before Mongo Park. But Park was sent there for some reason, to find the source, the direction and outlet of the river. Of this theory, Park was able to scientifically establish that the river flows eastward. He couldn't find the outlet as he died on the mission. About the source, he didn't find the source as he started around this area, although he established that there were some tributary rivers to it. Mongo Park died tragically after joining most of the river Niger. His information helped in marking the river on the map, and this works was completed by the Landa brothers, who took it from where he stopped and followed it to the Atlantic. He was crowned the discoverer of river Niger because of the following. Firstly, he was the first European to work on it. He worked on it at the time Europeans regarded as age of discovery in their own history. Unlike naming them like people that discovered protons and other chemicals that has never been really discovered before, the British could have simply honored people like him for their works. But this happened at the time when they compete with other countries, especially Portuguese and Spanish, in exploring the world, and things are being discovered by Europeans. Therefore, anyone who finds new things or accomplishes something useful for them is said to have discovered, and that has become the trend and a more honorable title in the age of discovery. Therefore, today, we have many things like Speck discovering the River Nile in 1862 and other such things. Don't forget, Speck was not the first European or British at the Nile, as many had labored before him to discover its source, but failed. Also, Nile was not part of the interior of Africa that was just under exploration, but the source of the Nile which is Lake Victoria, which is in the interior, and that is what was discovered. Although in most cases, spec works do come with details of his works, 
as discovering the source of the Nile as Lake Victoria is sometimes regarded as discovering River Nile. Sir David Livingstone was said to have discovered Victoria Falls, of which the achievement was that he was the first European to have been there. I must also note it here that each European kingdom saw all this as an attestation to their greatness when being compared to their counterparts. So it is important to stress it as much as possible in their history classes and books. When formal education started in Africa, it started with the efforts of the missionaries and later the colonial government. They selected specific parts of their own curriculum and textbooks to teach young African students. They include European history, culture, and religion at different levels. Reasons for this include they want basic education that will train people who can read and write for the purpose of working as interpreters, messengers, clerks, and reading the Bible. Things gradually improved though. Colonizers saw their colonies as an extension of their own territory. Europeans who lived in Africa during that period had their children in schools in Africa too and wants their children to obtain what is obtainable at home. So gradually, the educational system advanced and European education was what was being taught. When African countries started gaining independence, they discovered that this curriculum were designed to make them dependent on their masters. They were also now having a written history. Soon, they started making new curriculums and books and gradually updating, suiting it up for their own needs. Till the 1970s, 80s, even Nigerians, Ghanaians, and so on studied their colonizers' educational curriculum. But of course, it was being modified from time to time. Hardly, some were forgotten, and we still learn about them till 2010 in Nigeria. I don't know of this time. Therefore, I would conclude that all those trends came from European curriculum and education and were originally not designed to claim that Africans lived by the river Niger, but were blind not to see it as people see. In the advanced European history and African history, when the story of each explorers were examined, the stories always indicate details like the first European or other things like Mongo Park escaping paying River Niger tolls from the locals and being ambushed several times on it. They don't come in a single sentence with little explanations such as Mongo Park discovered River Niger. They are usually a broader view of the stories, but they are only being taught to those who focused on the study of history at tertiary level but shortened at primary educational level. And of course, European explorers renamed some rivers and mountains after themselves or notable figures of their time. Example is the Lake Victoria, which is called Nalubali by the Lugandans, meaning Mother of Guardian Gods. Victoria Falls, Musiaotunya, meaning the smoke that thunders. River Niger, as a name, is said to have come from the Greeks. While other theories said it came from a Baba phrase, Jaenja, meaning River of Rivers. Meanwhile, since the Great River flows through several kingdoms, it has many names Kwara, Turubeni, Oya, Oshimiri, Joliba, and many others. In the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda border, we have the Wenzori Mountains or Mountains of the Moon. Each mountain was given its own name, and that includes Mount Speck, Mount Baker. Mount Stanley, and so on. Of course, all these are from the British, 
but other colonizers and explorers did the same, although fewer than that of the British. This is the first map of Africa, and it was drawn by a German cartographer named Monster Sebastian in the mid-1500s. He drew the map with the help of the information he gathered from his fellow German scholars, missionaries, and people from various countries. He updates the map from time to time with new information he receives before he died of the New World smallpox in 1552. The shape of the map is not so much close to that one we have today, but it's not only because they are still gathering information about the continent, he also drew the map of Europe, map of Americas and Asia, which are also devoid of the shape we have today, but still close though, so maybe we can attribute that to the technology of his time. Many names on the map are written in ancient Latin, but not all. For example, this is a Latin word for kingdom. As you can see, the word is used many times on the map. Nubian kingdom, Melindi kingdom, Mali kingdom, and so on. Crown images are used to identify the kingdoms as well. These are the kingdoms known to the European explorers as at the time. Egypt and most of other northern parts of the map are also written in Latin, and this is because they've had a quite long relationship with them. And so, there is a Latin pronunciation and spelling for those parts. But in areas where there are new kingdoms or items, which has no spelling in Latin, Monster documented them as close as he could hear it from its pronunciation. And the effect of this is that some places on the map are difficult to translate today, even if you can translate Latin words. So, I'm going to do some random interpretation of the contents of the map and explain why some weird stuff appeared on them. To the right here, we can see the Kingdom of Selam. It's a historical port in Somalia today and it is spelled Zila or Zila. It's traded with Asia, Europe, and Egyptian traders during most that day. This is the town east coast of Kenya, and it's now spelled Malindi. It is a port city. Through its port, Malindi's ruler once sent a personal envoy with a giraffe as a present to China on a fleet. Amarich cities. This area has a church icon on it, and the word translates to something like Amarich Seat Priest John. During this time, there was a myth that there is a king called John who ruled over a wealthy Christian kingdom in Africa. He also has some mythical creatures in his kingdom. Where we have South Africa today, Africa Extremitas. Surely, it means tip of Africa, and this invalidates the claim that Africa as a name for the continent came in the late 17th century, because Monster wouldn't have called this part the tip of Africa if the whole land he drew in the map is not already known as Africa at the time in 1500s. This is the Azania region. Azania is derived from ancient Greek word for dark-skinned and of great stature. The area was first inhabited by the Kushites before the Bantus migrated there around the 10th century AD. They traded goods such as oils, knives, glasses, iron with the rest of the world before the age of discovery. Munster adds a one-eyed creature drawn on in the area where we can see covers today Nigeria and Cameroon with the name Monoculi written on it. Creatures like these are mostly known as cyclops and they are giant in size. They are rumored to be inhabiting the area at the beginning of the age of discovery. The creatures are mythical creatures from Greek and Roman mythologies. In one popular Greek film called The Odyssey, 
there was a cyclops called Polyphemus, son of a god called Poseidon. So when talking about the European exploration of Sub-Saharan Africa, the rest of West Africa were the first to be explored by the Spanish and Portuguese as early as 1472. Therefore, those parts look a bit detailed. You can see many kingdoms and rivers there. Senegal Eiffel is a short form of Senegal Fluvius from Latin, which means Senegal River. The Senegal River ends in St. Louis around here and starts in Mali. Though on the map, it almost starts in Nigeria. Meanwhile, the river Niger, which cuts across Nigeria today and ends in the Atlantic Ocean, is here to be drawn to reach Nigeria, but remains stranded in Lake Libya in this area. Thanks to the efforts of Mongo Park and Landa brothers, who were able to trace different parts of the river and help put it on the map to reach the Atlantic. I will bring it to your notice that River Niger is being called so many different names by the natives of Africa at that time and no one is able to tell whether they are a single flowing river. For example, it's called Isa Egrian, Joliba, Kwara, Kora, Mayo, Balio, Kora, Oya, and so on. So then, we have the northern parts of Africa, which were not really new to the Europeans, but they of course joined together with the rest of the continent in this map. If you didn't skip the intro, we've talked about how the name Ethiopia means burnt skin. It is generally used for the dark skin populace in Africa. Libya here is not the same Libya as it is today. Libya is a name in the Greek used to refer to the entire region of North Africa except for Egypt and then in some cases as a name for the continent. In 1934, Italy in its colonial activities combined some tribes together and called them Libya, which is the Libya that exists as at the time of making this video. The title reads, This makes universal differentiation of all of Africa even more than Ptolemy's terms. Ptolemy in this reference is Claudius Ptolemius, who is his second century geographer who had drawn this map of the old world and this is a translation from Italian. In conclusion, I would say the cartographer tried a lot but this map is based on the information and speculations he gathered from people who he was able to reach out to. By 1485, Joao Afonso, a Portuguese and his men had reached Bini Kingdom in modern day Nigeria and it could have gotten better description of the area instead of the monopoly. The rivers on the map such as Niger, Senegal and River Nile, even though they are not correct, his speculations on them are okay and they serve as hypotheses for other explorers to know where to start their investigations. <laughs>